Chapter Two, Part One of the Shadow Line: A Confession by Joseph Conrad. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Chapter Two, Part One. He shook hands with me. Well, there you are, on your own, appointed officially under my responsibility. He was actually walking with me to the door. What a distance off it seemed! I moved like a man in bonds. But we reached it at last. I opened it with the sensation of dealing with mere dream stuff, and then at the last moment the fellowship of seamen asserted itself, stronger than the difference of age and station. It asserted itself in Captain Ellis's voice. Goodbye, and good luck to you, he said so heartily that I could only give him a grateful glance. Then I turned and went out, never to see him again in my life. I had not made three steps into the outer office when I heard behind my back a gruff, loud, authoritative voice, the voice of our deputy Neptune. It was addressing the head shipping master, who, having let me in, had apparently remained hovering in the middle distance ever since. Mr. R., let the harbour launch have steam up to take the captain here on board the Melita at half-past nine tonight. I was amazed at the startled assent of R.'s yes, sir. He ran before me out on the landing. My new dignity sat yet so lightly on me that I was not aware that it was I, the captain, the object of this last graciousness. It seemed as if all of a sudden a pair of wings had grown on my shoulders. I merely skimmed along the polished floor. But R was impressed. I say, he exclaimed on the landing, while the melee crew of the steam launch, standing by, looked stonily at the man for whom they were going to be kept on duty so late away from their gambling, from their girls, or their pure domestic joys. I say, his own launch! What have you done to him? His stare was full of respectful curiosity. I was quite confounded. Was it for me? I hadn't the slightest notion, I stammered out. He nodded many times. Yes, and the last person who had it before you was a duke, so there. I think he expected me to faint on the spot but I was in too much of a hurry for emotional displays. My feelings were already in such a whirl that this staggering information did not seem to make the slightest difference. It fell into the seething cauldron of my brain, and I carried it off with me after a short but effusive passage of leave-taking with R. The favour of the great throws an aureole round the fortunate object of its selection. That excellent man inquired whether he could do anything for me, he had known me only by sight, and he was well aware he would never see me again. I was, in common with the other seamen of the port, merely a subject for official writing, filling up of forms with all the artificial superiority of a man of pen and ink to the men who grapple with realities outside the consecrated walls of official buildings. What ghosts we must have been to him! mere symbols to juggle with in books and heavy registers, without brains and muscles and perplexities, something hardly useful and decidedly inferior. And he, the office hours being over, wanted to know if he could be of any use to me. I ought, properly speaking, I ought to have been moved to tears, but I did not even think of it. It was only another miraculous manifestation of that day of miracles. I parted from him as if he had been a mere symbol, I floated down the staircase. I floated out of the official and imposing portal. I went on floating along. I use that word rather than the word flew, because I have a distinct impression that, though uplifted by my aroused youth, my movements were deliberate enough. To that mixed white, brown, and yellow portion of mankind, out abroad on their own affairs, I presented the appearance of a man walking rather sedately, and nothing in the way of abstraction could have equaled my deep detachment from the forms and colours of this world. It was, as it were, absolute, and yet, suddenly, I recognised Hamilton. I recognised him without effort, without a shock, without a start. There he was, strolling towards the harbour office, with his stiff, arrogant dignity. His red face made him noticeable at a distance. It flamed over there on the shady side of the street. He had perceived me too. Something, unconscious exuberance of spirits perhaps, moved me to wave my hand to him elaborately. This lapse from good taste happened before I was aware that I was capable of it. The impact of my impudence stopped him short, 
much as a bullet might have done. I verily believe he staggered, though as far as I could see, he didn't actually fall. I had gone past in a moment and did not turn my head. I had forgotten his existence. The next ten minutes might have been ten seconds or ten centuries for all my consciousness had to do with it. People might have been falling dead around me, houses crumbling, guns firing. I wouldn't have known. I was thinking, by Jove, I've got it. It being the command. It had come about in a way utterly unforeseen in my modest daydreams. I perceived that my imagination had been running in conventional channels and that my hopes had always been drab stuff. I had envisaged a command as a result of a slow course of promotion in the employ of some highly respectable firm. The reward of faithful service. Well, faithful service was all right. One would naturally give that for one's own sake, for the sake of the ship, for the love of the life of one's choice, not for the sake of the reward. There is something distasteful in the notion of a reward. And now here I had my command, absolutely in my pocket, in a way undeniable indeed, but most unexpected, beyond my imaginings, outside all reasonable expectations, and even notwithstanding the existence of some sort of obscure intrigue to keep it away from me. It is true that the intrigue was feeble, but it helped the feeling of wonder, as if I had been specially destined for that ship I did not know by some power higher than the prosaic agencies of the commercial world. A strange sense of exultation began to creep into me. If I had worked for that command ten years or more, there would have been nothing of the kind. I was a little frightened. Let us be calm, I said to myself. Outside the door of the officer's home, the wretched steward seemed to be waiting for me. There was a broad flight of a few steps, and he ran to and fro on the top of it as if chained there. A distressed cur. He looked as though his throat were too dry for him to bark. I regret to say I stopped before going in. There had been a revolution in my moral nature. He waited open-mouthed, breathless, while I looked at him for half a minute. And you thought you could keep me out of it, I said scathingly. You said you were going home, he squeaked miserably. You said so, you said so. I wonder what Captain Ellis will have to say to that excuse, I uttered slowly with a sinister meaning. His lower jaw had been trembling all the time, and his voice was like the bleeding of a sick goat. You have given me away? You have done for me? Neither his distress nor yet the sheer absurdity of it was able to disarm me. It was the first instance of harm being attempted to be done to me, at any rate the first I had ever found out and I was still young enough, still too much on this side of the shadow line, not to be surprised and indignant at such things. I gazed at him inflexibly. Let the beggar suffer. He slapped his forehead and I passed in, pursued into the dining room by his screech. I always said you'd be the death of me. This clamor not only overtook me, but went ahead, as it were, onto the veranda and brought out Captain Giles. He stood before me in the doorway in all the commonplace solidity of his wisdom. The gold chain glittered on his breast. He clutched a smouldering pipe. I extended my hand to him warmly, and he seemed surprised, but did respond heartily enough in the end with a faint smile of superior knowledge, which cut my thanks short as if with a knife. I don't think that more than one word came out, and even for that one, judging by the temperature of my face, I had blushed as if for a bad action. Assuming a detached tone, I wondered how on earth he had managed to spot the little underhand game that had been going on. He murmured complacently that there were but few things done in the town that he could not see the inside of, and as to this house, he had been using it off and on for nearly ten years. Nothing that went on in it could escape his great experience. It had been no trouble to him, no trouble at all. Then, in his quick, thick tone, he wanted to know if I had complained formally of the steward's action. I said that I hadn't, though indeed it was not for want of opportunity. Captain Ellis had gone for me bald-headed in a most ridiculous fashion for being out of the way when wanted. Funny old gentleman, interjected Captain Giles. What did you say to that? I said simply that I came along the very moment I heard of his message. Nothing more. I didn't want to hurt the steward. I would scorn to harm such an object. No, I made no complaint, but I believe he thinks I've done so. Let him think. 
He's got a fright that he won't forget in a hurry, for Captain Ellis would kick him out into the middle of Asia. Wait a moment, said Captain Giles, leaving me suddenly. I sat down, feeling very tired, mostly in my head. Before I could start a train of thought, he stood again before me, murmuring the excuse that he had to go and put the fellow's mind at ease. I looked up with surprise, but in reality I was indifferent. He explained that he had found the steward lying face downwards on the horsehair sofa. He was all right now. He would not have died of fright, I said contemptuously. No, but he might have taken an overdose out of one of them little bottles he keeps in his room, Captain Giles argued seriously. The confounded fool has tried to poison himself once a couple of years ago. Really, I said without emotion, he doesn't seem very fit to live anyhow. As to that, it may be said of a good many. Don't exaggerate like this, I protested, laughing irritably. But I wonder what this part of the world would do if you were to leave off looking after it, Captain Giles. Here you have got me a command and saved the steward's life in one afternoon. Though why you should have taken all that interest in either of us is more than I can understand. Captain Giles remained silent for a minute, then gravely. He's not a bad steward, really. He can find a good cook at any rate, and what's more, he can keep him when found. I remember the cooks we had here before his time. I must have made a movement of impatience, because he interrupted himself with an apology for keeping me yarning there, while no doubt I needed all my time to get ready. What I really needed was to be alone for a bit. I seized this opening hastily. My bedroom was a quiet refuge in an apparently uninhabited wing of the building. Having absolutely nothing to do, for I had not unpacked my things, I sat down on the bed and abandoned myself to the influences of the hour, to the unexpected influences. And first I wondered at my state of mind. Why was I not more surprised? Why? Here I was, invested with a command in the twinkling of an eye, not in the common course of human affairs, but more as if by enchantment. I ought to have been lost in astonishment, but I wasn't. I was very much like people in fairy tales. Nothing ever astonishes them. When a fully appointed gala coach is produced out of a pumpkin to take her to a ball, Cinderella does not exclaim. She gets in quietly and drives away to her high fortune. Captain Ellis, a fierce sort of fairy, had produced a command out of a drawer almost as unexpectedly as in a fairy tale. But a command is an abstract idea, and it seemed a sort of lesser marvel till it flashed upon me that it involved the concrete existence of a ship. A ship. My ship. She was mine, more absolutely mine for possession and care than anything in the world. An object of responsibility and devotion. She was there waiting for me, spellbound, unable to move, to live, to get out into the world till I came, like an enchanted princess. Her call had come to me as if from the clouds. I had never suspected her existence. I didn't know how she looked. I had barely heard her name. And yet we were indissolubly united for a certain portion of our future, to sink or swim together. A sudden passion of anxious impatience rushed through my veins and gave me such a sense of the intensity of existence as I have never felt before or since. I discovered how much of a seaman I was in heart, in mind, and, as it were, physically, a man exclusively of sea and ships, the sea the only world that counted, and the ships the test of manliness, of temperament, of courage and fidelity, and of love. I had an exquisite moment. It was unique also. Jumping up from my seat, I paced up and down my room for a long time. But when I came into the dining room, I behaved with sufficient composure. I only couldn't eat anything at dinner. Having declared my intention not to drive, but to walk down to the quay, I must render the wretched steward justice that he bestirred himself to find me some coolies for the luggage. They departed, carrying all my worldly possessions, except the little money I had in my pocket slung from a long pole. Captain Giles volunteered to walk down with me. We followed the sombre, shaded alley across the esplanade. It was moderately cool there under the trees. Captain Giles remarked with a sudden laugh, I know who's jolly thankful at having seen the last of you. I guessed that he meant the steward. The fellow had borne himself to me in a sulkily frightened manner at the last. I expressed my wonder that he should have tried to do me a bad turn for no reason at all. 
Don't you see that what he wanted was to get rid of our friend Hamilton by dodging him in front of you for that job? That would have removed him for good, see? Heavens, I exclaimed, feeling humiliated somehow. Can it be possible? What a fool he must be. That overbearing, impudent loafer. Why, he couldn't. And yet he's nearly done it, I believe, for the harbour office was bound to send somebody. I, a fool like our steward, can be dangerous sometimes, declared Captain Giles sententiously. Just because he is a fool, he added, imparting further instruction in his complacent low tones. For, he continued, in the manner of a set demonstration, no sensible person would risk being kicked out of the only berth between himself and starvation just to get rid of a simple annoyance, a small worry. Would he now? Well, no, I conceded, restraining a desire to laugh at that something mysteriously earnest in delivering the conclusions of his wisdom as though they were the product of prohibited operations. But that fellow looks as if he were rather crazy. He must be. As to that, I believe everybody in the world is a little mad, he announced quietly. You make no exception, I inquired, just to hear his answer. He kept silent for a little while, then got home in an effective manner. Why, Kent says that even of you. Does he? I retorted, extremely embittered all at once against my former captain. There's nothing of that in the written character from him which I've got in my pocket. Has he given you any instances of my lunacy? Captain Giles explained in a conciliating tone that it had been only a friendly remark in reference to my abrupt leaving the ship for no apparent reason. I muttered grumpily, Oh, leaving his ship and mended my pace. He kept up by my side in the deep gloom of the avenue, as if it were his conscientious duty to see me out of the colony as an undesirable character. He panted a little, which was rather pathetic in a way, but I was not moved. On the contrary, his discomfort gave me a sort of malicious pleasure. End of chapter 2, part 1 Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine